everybody's journey is their own responsibility. And as somebody takes the steps to elevate themselves and to really exercise their own rights to taking better care of themselves without having to ask for permission first, there will be people that cannot match that energy in your life. And undoubtedly, there will be people that fall away. And sometimes it's family, sometimes it's friends. And that's okay. And it's hard at first because we love these people and we're used to them being in our life. But it's okay for for us to have a new season of our life begin where, you know, people come into our life that can match where we're at because we're, we all mirror each other, right? If you ever want to get a really good gauge on kind of where you're at and where you're at just energetically and spiritually and just the, the parts of yourself, what you're putting off into the world, you take a look at who you've got around you right now. You take a look at this, the type of, of friendships or types of relationships that you have in your life, not necessarily saying that they're good, bad, or otherwise, but just the, the types of relationships you have. And those are, those are, that's a really good way to see, okay, so if the mirroring concept is true in, in what I see in myself, it's reflected in the people that are around me, it's a really good self-check to say, okay, well, this thing about this person bothers me. So there's something about that in myself that I should work on or, or else it wouldn't trigger me in the first place. And that's super beneficial when it comes to romantic relationships as well, because the people that we love and that we live and do life with, it's like they reflect back all of our crap. Every single thing about us that that is inside of us for us to heal they will bring that out of us. But we do the same for them too. And that's why relationships are beautiful because it's an exchange. Welcome to today's episode of Unleash Thyself. I'm your host, Constantin Moron. And today's guest is Tina Santos. Tina is a holistic life coach, member of the LGBT community and an animal advocate. Her passion in life is to help individuals to live their life fearlessly out loud. Join us for a beautiful conversation focused around becoming a better version of ourselves. We will look at Tina's journey, the lessons she's learned from her own adventures, and from the many people she's been able to help. We also dive into the connection between animals and us human beings. So, prepare yourself for an unforgettable conversation that's sure to leave a lasting impression. Welcome back to Unleash Thyself, the podcast that inspires and empowers you to unleash your full potential. I am thrilled to welcome Tina Santos to the show. Tina, we can't wait to hear more about the experiences and insights that have led you to where you are today and your unleashed moment, the moment you knew you were on your own path to becoming the best version of yourself. Tina, it's such a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. So tell us, where does your journey begin? This transformational journey you've been on for, you know, quite a bit of time now. I would say my journey began around 18, 19 years old. I was given, well, prior to that, I wasn't really raised with any specific religious background or spiritual background. And so that was actually a blessing in, in a way because it led me to kind of discover what felt right for me. Mm -hmm. And around the 18-year-old mark, I was given a book by an author called Brian Weiss. And it was, I'm not sure if, I'm sure your listeners would be familiar with him, but he works with patients and he does past life regressions and helps people heal parts of themselves that are wounded that in this current life they can't find resolution for. And so the book is called Only Love is Real. And it changed my mind. It changed my entire life, actually. The story was basically about how he had two separate patients and through regressing them, and they were talking to him about their past lives while under hypnosis, they, he realized that these two people were connected in each other's past lives romantically and in other ways, you know, but they were very, very often romantic partners. But of course, because of the patient doctor confidentiality, he could not share that with them. And so the whole book was about how they were uncovering their past lives and different 
physical ailments or emotional ailments that they hadn't been able to resolve up to that point were resolving because they were basically reliving them and making peace with them. And they were understanding why they had these pains and these wounds. But all along, he knew that these two people were destined to be together. So at the end of the book, they end up coming together on sort of natural terms. You know, he couldn't do anything to facilitate it, but it was, it was quite a life-changing book because it put into perspective a lot of different ways of thinking that I hadn't thought about. And that kind of just led me to just jump in and read all that I could read and get all the knowledge that I could get about anything, any your a soul's journey. And that just really set me on my path to where I am today. Oh, that's awesome. And speak about the inspiring books or shows or movies or anything that we watch at a certain point in time that put us on, on a path like this. Yeah. So after you read that book, and you mentioned you didn't have an, a religious or spiritual upbringing. How skeptical were you about what was said in the book? The fact that we live multiple lives, right? The fact that we have previous lives and we can actually go back and see this stuff, right? Because that's something that's not mainstream. It's not necessarily accepted by everyone. I don't feel like I was skeptical. I, I feel like I, I know I believed it to like it felt true. When I was reading it, I had this visceral reaction in me that made it made me feel, wow, this could actually be true. But then we have our ego mind that is all the things that we have been taught and conditioned about. And then that comes in. And yeah, there is a part of, of people that are, you know, the skeptic, you know, and you go, how could that even be true? How is that? But I never disbelieved the capability of us to be able to experience those things. So I guess just my just my openness and my non-conditioned mind, you know, to that it just led me to be able to, to resonate with those things pretty easily. But I think it's more of just, we fear what we don't understand that, you know, that whole concept. And so there was just a part of me that was like, well, how would that even be possible? I want to experience that. It was more of like, yeah. I, it was a more of a desire of like me too. You know, I want to, I want to experience those things. That's, that's beautiful the way you said it. And I love the one you touched on the, um non-conditioning right because if you grew up in an environment where you avoided by choice or otherwise right certain conditions it may be easier for you to have an open mind and yeah. accept not necessarily accept but at least approach things from a different angle and say you know what that might be possible if it makes sense to me if it feels true in my heart then perhaps there's something that i can do more research and i can go down the rabbit hole and see if it if it's a fit or not or if i truly yeah. believe it at the end of the line so let me ask you this so you read a book you begin your journey did you do any past life regression yourself because i would imagine you probably were very intrigued and wanted to do some for you i did actually i did i that was it, it was I, gosh it's so funny thinking about that time because i was 18 and i just turned 40 so it seems like a lifetime ago but I at the you know I began my search for like-minded people in in my area and I live in the south and that's not always something that's like you said super mainstream to to think about stuff in spirituality like this. So I started doing some research to find practitioners in the area that offered those sorts of things and I did. I found I found somebody in the in the local area that did that and I went to her and had a regression and it I, I got a lot out of it and I'm happy to share that if you want. The other side of it is I felt at that time so much resistance when I was going through the process because even though they say, you know, just kind of relax and, and don't think, you know, try not to think about anything too specific and just enjoy the process and, and have it as it comes. It's hard to do that when you're when you're there because you've got that part of your brain going, well, I need to have an experience and I want to have an experience and you're almost forcing yourself to. So that was my very early on lesson to just relax and let things happen. But it, it was pretty amazing. I, I experienced three different past lives. Some I, I could see more vividly than others. I always have had trouble visualizing when it comes to visual meditations and things. I'm much more of a feeler. Okay. Uh, so when I meditate or when I do guided meditations, I do it more like I think of how I'm experiencing it with like the wind or the sun or something like that versus picturing a scene that's just easier for me. But I do remember this. I There was a lot of Native American past lives in there. There was a lot of 
there was one I was in England and I was, and I don't know if I was from England, but I was in England and it there were, I was from a poor family. And I, I remember looking down and seeing the shoes that I was wearing and I was a young boy in that past life. So it, it was all just very amazing to experience those things because you walk away going, I understand parts of myself better. You know, every time we, we engage in these sorts of experiences and we kind of relax to the process, we learn a little bit about ourselves each time and it helps us understand who we are physically in this body now. Yes. You know, and that's what fascinates me about it all. I just, I've been privileged to be a part of several different types of ceremonies and uh, just it, it, in every time I'm a part of something new where it's something that I've never done before. I love it because I always walk away going, well, that's something I didn't expect. <laughs> yes. You know, and it just, you walk forward in your life knowing that we are bigger than this, you know, and like, there's not a doubt in my mind that we're bit, we're way bigger than all of this. Exactly. And I think that was a big aha moment for me as well. And I always ask myself the question is like, there's, there must be more to life than what we are shown in society and media. But I never yeah. did anything about it until a bit later in life. And then once you realize that, like you said, once you realize there's more to life than just what we perceive with our senses, at least, you know, the ones that we can visualize or touch, you can't unsee that, right? You can't unlearn that. And it's so beautiful because then your journey truly begins. At least I've seen it with me and others around me. You know, once you understand that, once you truly grasp that aspect of life, then it becomes so much more than you could ever dream. Yeah. And I, I, I always kind of refer to it as being, you know, having my head come up above water. Mm. And you start kind of waking up to a lot of these, these concepts and these ideas and, you know, different things feel right for different people. So there's, there's not one black and white version of, of spiritual growth for everybody. Exactly. Right. So everybody's going to discover what feels right to them on their own path. But one thing I have discovered in what led me to, you know, get on my journey with my life coaching and my energy healing work and things. It's just the, the common theme of we really are all the same, you know, as, as humans, we all desire the same thing. We all want the same things. And primarily even I've talked to clients that had all the money that they could ever need. And I've talked to clients on the opposite in the spectrum that struggled a lot. And the one common thing that everybody wants is just happiness and peace. You know, one of, one of my clients who, you know, was definitely doing okay for themselves and had no struggle, you know, says I, there's gotta be something bigger. I've done, I've had success in my career. I've done all the things, but there's gotta be something bigger. And I need to discover that. And I need to discover that within myself. Cause I know I'm capable of so much more. And, you know, when you hear people that are doing well in life and they still feel like something's missing. It just proves that, you know, our spiritual side, that side we have to really tend to, because I feel like that's one of the most fulfilling things we can do. And that can come in the form of, you know, having some sort of consistent practice that we use or serving others. Serving others is a major thing that I think is very fulfilling and that people, people really thrive being able to do. Um, Absolutely. But it's, it's definitely a part of ourselves that needs to be tended to and to acknowledge. And yeah. And I, and I just, I think that everybody is kind of on that path right now. I feel like we're definitely in a, in a time where everybody's <laughs> searching and grasping because they, they know there's gotta be something bigger than this craziness that's all around. Yeah, us. Yeah, And I mean, we can thank COVID and everything that happened with that, that opened the eyes of many more people to the fact that being closed off away from others, working, whatever you're working and not being in line with you, what you feel in your heart, all these things are coming around now. And also I believe with the new generations, they get to see what their parents and their grandparents did chasing the American dream. And how, even though, like you said, you acquired all these possessions, all these monetary gains, yeah. but you're not happy. You're not joyful. You don't have the peace that you're looking for. And yeah. I, I, I feel that that's why a lot of younger people are like, no, I don't want to go down the same path. I mean, what's the point of going 
or climbing the corporate ladder to make all this money, work 12, 14 hours a day, and then do what? I don't yeah. want to wait till 60 or 70 to live my life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when I, when I, when I coach my clients and they go, well, I want to feel more fulfilled and I want to, you know, some of my first questions are, okay, so what does that look like for you? What does that mean for you? And then when they give me that answer, it's like, okay, so how can we incorporate that into their, into your life? And very quickly people go, oh, well, I've got this and I've got my kids and I've got my family and all that. And, and trust me, I've got two teenagers and a family and the whole thing. And I, and I know how fast time goes from day to day. But I have learned that self-care and just that just tending to our needs is, is a really vital piece of, of the puzzle right now for our health, just for our families. Every, for, it benefits everybody. It's that trickle-down effect. Exactly. Yeah. And you mentioned a few minutes ago, actually, the idea of people feeling what's different than a change, especially, right? And being yeah. resistive to it. And I see that a lot as well. And it sounds like with your clients as well and people around you when you're talking about well you want that but then all of a sudden you back off because now nah, there's too much work or not to say too much work i mean you find excuses as i have my family or i have these commitments i can't actually give time to myself and trust me i've been there myself so many times and our mind is really good at tricking us into believing mm -hmm. the excuses that we tell ourselves and then yeah. at least for me when i stop listing excuses and then instead focusing on what I can do and the choices I have, everything changed. Yeah. I remember watching a, a documentary or maybe more so of an interview several years ago. And this woman made a point that I have never forgotten since I watched it. But she said that most people will stay in a certain level of existence mm -hmm. because of comfort, because if they do the work to elevate themselves to a better place, to where they're doing better, you know, mind, body, and soul, then the folks around them will expect the better version of themselves. And that's a lot of pressure for somebody to think of. So it's a lot easier to just kind of revert back and just stay where we're at because that way nobody really expects more from us. And I remember when I heard that, I was like, wow, that makes total sense. Yes. Because, you know, yeah, if people, if people see you as becoming this new and improved version of yourself, they're like, well, I want some of that. I want some of that, you know, knowledge, or I want some of that person's energy around me or their company, you know, and then all of a sudden we're a little more in demand. And, you know, that's, that's, I think where the opportunity to really step up and make a positive difference in the lives around us is, is vital because it's almost like our, our, it's our right to be, to become our improved versions of ourselves. And there's so many resources out there now for folks to take advantage of, to elevate themselves. And it's, it's such a time of shedding all of the old beliefs. It's such a time of shedding all of the old, you know, excuse my, my language, but all that old bullshit that we're just fed over and over again, because none of it is real. None of it, you know, it may feel real at a certain point in our life, but when we outgrow it, it's not true for us anymore. And it's okay. It's almost like people need permission to step up to that next level. And it's okay, you know, and that's what I like to do is to look at people in the eyes and say, it's actually okay for you to, you know, take a bath at the end of the night if you want to, or it's actually okay for you to go and take a walk after you get out of work to cool your mind down before you go home to your family. Like everything is okay. You know, and, and once you start putting those things as priority in your life, you'll be surprised how everything kind of conforms to allow that to happen for you in ways that you can't even think of before. It's as simple as starting an exercise routine. You know, I've been there many times, you know, thinking about, well, gosh, I work, you know, these many hours and I have these responsibilities and where am I going to fit in doing these things that I want for myself? And then you get into it and all of a sudden you find time for it and you realize that everybody's okay at home. Like it's taking an hour to myself isn't going to demolish any plans that we have. You know, it's almost like you just realize that when it's for your greater good, it always, it always finds a way of working out. And that can apply to anything, you know, and I, and I firmly believe that. And 
yeah, it's so that's that's kind of just been my discovery process. Oh, Tina, that's awesome. I mean, I agree with pretty much everything you said there. And a couple of things I want to touch on. First one, the permission. I had an aha moment with myself a few months ago during a meditation. And it came to me this idea that we always ask for permission externally. So, you know, to your boss, can I take this vacation time? Can I go off to do X, Y, and Z? To parents, to teachers, to others. It's almost like we're looking for validation and permission from everyone but ourselves. And what I realized for me is that when I started asking for permission to myself and not anyone else, that's when things start to happen. Do I want to be happy? Can I, per can I give myself permission to be happy? Okay, so how does it look? Can I give myself permission, like you said, to take an hour and go on this walk and the world will not fall apart? And when I shifted that mindset for my own good, a lot of things changed as well. Because all of a sudden, I'm not going to, let's say, my family and say, oh, do you mind if I go for one hour walk before I do the dishes or before I do something? No, now it's with me. I want to go on the walk and I reframe it. I'm going on this walk for myself. I'm going to take care of whatever chores or responsibilities I have when I come back. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I've been in that same position too. And thankfully, you know, I'm, I'm supported in that and, and I'm encouraged to do so because you, when, when people around you that love and care about you see that the things you're doing for yourself is, is benefiting you in a positive way, then they benefit, right? Because you are more in a space to give more of yourself if you are replenishing yourself. Exactly. And I love you know, to mention this earlier as well. And you mentioned the idea of as you change, as you grow, elevate, people will want some of that as well. And some people will be scared and, and drift away. And for me, that was a big roadblock in a way when I'm, I began my journey because I'm like, oh, I don't want to lose friends or family members or people that will not necessarily elevate with me to the new frequency and they'll be left behind. But then I realized I'm not doing anything for them. I'm doing it for me. And as a result of me changing, becoming a better version of myself, unleashing myself, all of a sudden, everyone around me can benefit from it. Now, it's their choice if they want to take any of those benefits and apply them to their life. But they will benefit nonetheless because I'm a better version of myself. Right. And, you know, everybody's journey is their own responsibility. And as somebody takes the steps to elevate themselves and to really exercise their own rights to taking better care of themselves without having to ask for permission first, there will be people that cannot match that energy in your life and and, undoubt, and undoubtedly there will be people that fall away and sometimes it's family sometimes it's friends you know and and that's okay and, and it's hard at first because we love these people and we're used to them being in our life but it's okay for for us to have a new season of our life begin where you know people come into our life that can match where we're at because we're we all mirror each other right so I, I do believe in the concept of, of mirroring. So the people that we're closest to in our life, if you ever want to get a really good gauge on kind of where you're at and where you're at just energetically and spiritually and just the, the parts of yourself, what you're putting off into the world, you take a look at who you've got around you right now. You take a look at this, the type of, of friendships or types of relationships that you have in your life not necessarily saying that they're good, bad, or otherwise, but just the the types of relationships you have. And those are those are, that's a really good way to see, okay, so if the mirroring concept is true in, in what I see in myself, I you know, it, it's reflected in the people that are around me. It's a really good self-check, you know, to say, okay, well, this thing about this person bothers me. So there's something about that in myself that I should work on or, or else it wouldn't trigger me in the first place. So well said. Um, I love that. You know, and, and that's super beneficial when it comes to romantic relationships as well, because, you know, the people that we love and that we live and do life with, it's like they reflect back all of our crap. Every single thing about us that, that is inside of us for us to heal they will bring that out of us, but we do the same for them too. And that's why relationships are beautiful because it's an exchange, you know, but I, I do, I do keep that in mind as well. 
and try to suggest that to, to folks when they're kind of in a stuck place. And I say, take a look at the people that are around you, you know, take a look at the quality of relationships that are around you. What are the characteristics of those? What does that look like? You know, what would you like to have improved in those relationships? What would you like to have? Because basically it's all talking about what you want to have improved in yourself, you know, but sometimes it's a lot easier to kind of look externally and then apply that to ourselves. It's just an easier, sometimes it's an easier concept to process and to understand, to begin the growth process. Absolutely. I, I, I resonate with a hundred percent and it's a tough pill to swallow. I would say. Even now for me, yeah. this far in my journey, I still see some of those parts come up and I'm like, man, that's that's not cool. But then it's like, okay, how do you begin that process? And I think you listed a couple of good ways, right? You just have to be aware of it first. These are mm -hmm. the things I'm seeing that are not working. So let's see, okay, how what was the alternative? What's the best case scenario? So let's aim for that. And I, I really like that approach. Now yeah. Let me ask you this question. I know when you're talking about energy and energy work, and you do some of it, and if I'm not mistaken, you also work with animals. And I'm a big dog lover, right? I've had dogs all my life. And I'm curious to see what your experience has been with working with humans and working with animals and some of like the big aha moments or differences between working with the two. I, I often say that we don't deserve animals as human beings. It's like they're just the most amazing creatures and they are the epitome of unconditional love. And that I would say is the biggest difference between working with humans and working with animals, because, you know, of course, as people, we have, we have our critic, we have the inner critic, we have the ego mind, we have the parts of ourselves that won't shut the heck up and just let us experience something. Animals, they, there is no resistance, you know, they, they basically, they just receive, you know, but they also, they also have the capability of showing that they don't, they're not willing to receive any sort of energy work or something like that because they can get up and walk away and that's okay. But some of them will just lay there and they just, they love it. And, and, but yeah. And so I guess that would be the biggest, the biggest difference is just the lack of resistance coming from the animals. For yeah, sure. They don't have an ego that plays with, with what they're accepting of or allowing in or out. No, no they just, you know, they're not sitting there thinking, am I really experiencing this? Is this weird? Am I supposed to be feeling something different? You know, they just, they're just, they just exist, you know, they just exist and they want to love and they want to give you that love. And I mean, I've seen dogs come from, and cat, any animals actually just come from the worst situations that are rescued into good families. And without, any sort of second guessing themselves. They're just like all in giving everything they have to that new owner yeah. that's taking care of, you know, and it's special. It's super special. And I feel honored to work with them. Really. It's, I do feel it's like, it's very much an honor to do so much work with animals. So what do you actually do with animals? You do energy work. What's the goal behind you working with specific animals? So when it comes to energy work with animals, this, it depends on, it depends on what's going on at home, really, with, you know, the owners or the the foster caregivers. They often, they, they're obviously the best gauge of what's going on with the animals. And sometimes there's just trauma from pre previous experiences that they've had. Sometimes it's anxiety. Sometimes a, a lot of times there's a correlation between the owner of the animal and what the animal is experiencing or or showing their behaviors. Because again, you know, animals, they they sort of pick up on what we're feeling as humans and they sort of mirror that back to us, you know? So you can always tell if you've got an owner that's particularly on edge or more of an anxious person, their animals are usually a little more anxious or a little more jumpy. And so sometimes the, the work can be on both yeah. ends. It's not specific to the animals. Sometimes you can look at the owner and be like, Hey, you know, and I can talk to them about, different things for them as well. And and usually there's a correlation, you know, between, between the I two. I would imagine. And what's interesting to see that if someone, if let's say an owner or a foster owner as well, they are open to having their dogs work with you for energy work. That must, that must mean that they are likewise open to 
some sort of work, right? They may be resistant at times, I would imagine, but they're at least more open. So it might make your job a bit easier to work with both. To try to, sure. to, yeah. to go through. That's pretty nice. Yeah, it's 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 very neat and yeah, it's a beautiful process. I'd say I'm very I'm very grateful for being able to do the work that no, I do. Absolutely, that's I'm always fascinated about animals, like you said, unconditional love. And again, another thing that came to me in one of my meditations as well is this idea that the answer is love, but truly the answer. When I say the answer, I mean I mean like if we want to be a better version of ourselves, we just have to love more. And that means being more empathic, more considerate, whatever love means to you. But truly, you touched on this earlier, is that idea of unconditional love. Like animals already innately have that. Like my dog doesn't mm-hmm. care that I was gone for 12 hours, they'll still love me the same way when I come back, or if I was gone for three days on a work trip. But we as humans were very good at putting conditions around love without even realizing. And that was a big aha moment for me is when I realized that I cannot really say I love myself if I don't love all the parts of me. So, you know, those, maybe those memories of things I've done in the past I'm not really proud of or certain parts of how you look or anything that you don't like about yourself, can you truly say you love yourself if you don't, if you're not unconditional in that love? And then that expands to those around you, your animals, your partners, right? Your family, your friends, anyone else. And Personally, I don't necessarily have the answer on how do you go from loving something to unconditionally loving something. And I'm curious to see in your work, both with animals and humans, have you seen people be able to bridge that gap and stay there? Like, you know, just be unconditionally loving, except their kids, of course, because at that point, I would imagine young kids, you unconditionally love. I don't have any children, so I can't speak from experience, but I've seen others that have them. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the sarcastic parent in me goes, mm, there's sometimes where <laughs> yeah, when they hit teenage years, it's hard to unconditionally love them, but I'm kidding. No, I mean, children are a different category because, of course, you know, the love for a child is is just a different type of love. But, you know, yes, I have seen I have seen some people be able to bridge the gap and more often than not try to stay in that frame of mind. But it, it's a practice and it's and it's often dare I say, it could be kind of like a lifelong practice for people to rewire those parts of their brain and, and those parts of themselves to just stay in that constant state of, I think I think the biggest theme that comes with unconditional love is lack of expectation, right? We always want, you know, when we get in romantic relationships and all these songs and all these things, it's like love unconditionally and I'm going to love you no matter what and all this stuff. But really, that's not true for a lot of people. It's like, I love you no matter what until you do something that pisses me off and then I'm not going to be happy with you for a little while. And so it's it's one of those things where, you know, to at least attain that, that concept of unconditional love and try to practice it in our life, I think it's the release of expectations from whatever situation you're trying to apply that unconditional love to, which in theory, should be everything. It should be, you know, unconditional love from everything from the grass all the way up into, you know, a, a person that you meet at a grocery store. It's 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 like you just love without expectation. You love without expecting anything in return, you know, and not judging the the experience that somebody else is having, you know. Lack of judgment, lack of love of expectation, I think, are the keys, which are much easier said than done. Because we we very often will go through life and if you really pay attention to your thoughts, you know, you just can catch yourself thinking a certain thought about something when you're out at a grocery store or somebody that you see. And even if it's not something that you're actively trying to like put a lot of effort into, you can step back and go, why did I even think like that just then? Why did I have that thought? You know? And yeah, so it's it's hard. And I and I think that there's there's been a lot of folks that really have been putting in a lot of effort to try to live that life because it, it does take so much load off your shoulders. It takes so much responsibility off of yourself if you don't feel the need to judge or have expectations for what people do in their own life. Exactly. You know, yeah. we, we hold so much weight having expectations of, of what we want people to do or how we want them to experience something. And 
and it's that's none of our business. For know? most of us, and, I would imagine it's very tough because of conditioning. Because if you open oh, up social like, media, if you open up the news, if you do any of that stuff or follow any of it, and it's hard not to. It's exactly what yeah. we're being shown. Not because anyone has some ill intent, but that's because there are other expectations behind it. Like, oh, I want to show you this so I can sell you more things. Or I want to show you this so I can have you vote a certain way or do a certain thing in mm -hmm. life. Right? So when we put ourselves in, in those shoes, we understand why it's being done. Again, not necessarily as an ill intent, but we don't have a choice. Right? Yeah. And I think that's why it gets difficult, right? Because now you have to kind of go against the status quo, rewire your brain, all while you're living a normal life. And I, you know, normal when I say whatever normal is for you. And then mm -hmm. that's likely a lifelong journey. Yeah. And, and again, that goes back to the idea of surrounding yourself with the people and the things that can really encourage that growth and encourage that path. If that's what somebody wants, you know, chooses for themselves, it's and sometimes again, people will fall away. It may not look the same as it does right now, but that's okay because, you know, not everybody can walk the path with you and, and that's okay because when, when they're ready, they will, you know, and that's, that's hard and that can be scary to release the control of that and to let that be what it is. But it's, it's some, it's pretty necessary, I think, to get yourself to that next level, if that's what you want to do. I'm with you on that. Let me ask you this, you know, going back to the animals for a second. Can you tell us maybe one really big transformation you've noticed in working with an animal and, of course, their human counterparts? And maybe something that blew your mind away, even though you've been doing this work for so long? Yeah, I, you know, I can, I can kind of go back to one of my earlier patients because I've worked in animal hospitals for, for several years. And so that's, it's a really cool benefit that I have to be able to you know, work with animals kind of without having it be a formal setting. I can still do my work with the animals that I feel, you know, called to, to do. And so there was this one cat that had come into a previous animal hospital that I worked at and she was very fearful. She was, she was coming through a rescue group, but she was older. She was very sick. She, she had some kidney issues going on and, you know, she just would not, she didn't want it. She was so spicy. She didn't want anybody to touch her. And she was just kind of this, this grouchy old woman is really what she was, you know? And she went into this, the, their own little room, the cats had their own little area. And throughout the day you could open up the cages and kind of let them go around. They had their toys and things like that. And it was totally safe for them to be out in this one area and just to let them get some exercise during the day because folks could come in and adopt them if they wanted to, you know? And so I would go in with her and she liked to hide under the cages up against the wall, like where it's all kind of dark under the cages. You couldn't really see her very well, but I would go in with her and I would just sit on the floor and I would kind of just like open my hands a little bit and I would just look at her and just, you know, mentally have the intention of, you know, just sending her love and sending her healing. And obviously she, I couldn't have a conversation with her verbally for her to say to me, you know, this is going on, but it was more of just a constant, just flow of just loving, caring energy towards her. And I took about 15 to 20 minutes every day that I worked to go in and sit down and just do that with her. I didn't try to pet her. I didn't try to go up to her. I didn't try to encourage anything. I just simply went in there and just tried to send her that, that healing energy, you know, to try to get her a little more comfortable because I knew she was very fearful. And I would say after about four or five days, all of a sudden she like, she, I would go in there and I would sit and she like poked her head out from underneath the cages and she kind of just sat there and let me do it. She would lay down on the ground. And then every few days she came out and she would get closer and closer until after about two weeks, she came out and she like curled up in my lap and she let me put my hands on her and I would just work on her like that. And I remember my doctor that worked at the hospital, she's like, I have never seen her let anybody, you are the only person that can touch this cat right now, you know? That's um, awesome. And I just, I just thought it was a really cool moment because for me, it just solidified the idea that, you know, that, that work is real and that, and, and animals can feel that and they can appreciate that. And they know your intentions. They know, 
they know your heart and what you want to do, you know? And that's why they, uh, there's that saying, if my dog doesn't like you, then there's gotta be something wrong with you. It's like, I, I don't think that's a very crazy thought. You know, they're, they're very intuitive and they know, even though they're unconditional with wanting to give their love to people, they still know when, you know, it's time to kind of move away from somebody or something. Absolutely. Not right. Yeah. We definitely don't understand how that works for animals and we take it for granted at times. Right. Or we don't accept it, but that's a beautiful story. Yeah. Atina. That's, that's a beautiful, yeah. beautiful story. She was a good girl. She's, you know, she has since passed, like I said, but this was probably back in 2016 or so. And she was already about 13 or 14 at that time. And, you know, so unfortunately she's passed, but she was such a beautiful girl. And I was really grateful that she came to our hospital and was able to have a good, you know, last portion of, of her physical life so that she could be comfortable and, and well taken care of. So I'm very honored to have had that time with her. because She was yeah, one of the big things for me with animals is something that I haven't actually realized until probably late last year is the idea that animals that come into our life are teaching us so many different lessons and they come into our life usually, at least in my opinion, for a reason or two, for a purpose as well, to teach us and to guide us, protect us, whatever the case might be. And again, it's up to us to accept those messages and those lessons. And it wasn't until I really sat down and thought about how having my dogs right now has changed me as a person. And I'll give you an example where I had such a huge aha moment. Last year, for the first time in my life, I started doing professional sports with both of them. It was dog diving, the idea of going at the pool, there's a dog, dog is at the end. Yeah. I throw the toy from the front of the pool and then they jump in the air, go at a certain distance and catch the toy. And what happened here, this is where I am in Halifax, Nova Scotia, there's only one place about an hour away in the middle of nowhere. So it's beautiful country setting, forests and fields and everything you, you would like for a place to be meditative, do meditation in and any of the stuff. And I kept taking them because I knew how much they loved it, but I didn't realize how much it was doing for me, being able to sit in nature, sit with yeah. my own thoughts, but also connecting with the animal on a level where I'm like, wow. They don't care what they what they'll have for dinner tonight, or the chores that they may have to do tomorrow, or what happened in the past. It's just here in the moment. And by spending so much time with them and doing these sports, I realized how much living in the moment is important for all of us, and how little of it we do. And especially for me, it was very very true because either I'm thinking in the past, regretting something I didn't do, or worrying about something that has to happen later on. And the more I think about animals, yeah. and you're right, it's not just dogs or cats, it's any animals you, you have access to or you spend time with. There's so many lessons in there that we as humans can just take a step back and try to absorb and apply them to our own life. Yeah, they're, they're, they are their own kind of teacher. Exactly. You know, and uh, man... It's hard sometimes when you run into those people because they that say, oh, it's just a cat or it's just a dog. And I'm like, well, <laughs> no, they're not. You know, it's it's you just you can sense that they've just got so such a capacity. I, it's almost there's almost a little bit of envy in me when I look at them because they do. They, they have that live in the moment mentality. Everything is awesome. Everything is the best day ever. You know, I've got dogs that come into my work and their tail is almost wagging off their body and everybody's saying hi to them and they're like physically yeah. smiling you know? yeah. and like they're just like okay what are we doing let's go let's go and everything is just so happy and and you know I'm I'm kind of in this phase of my life that I've learned from being around the animals where I just I'm in a phase of wanting to say yes to things I'm in a phase of just wanting to go yeah let's try this that sounds fun let's do it you know because I had kind of, you know, my own aha moment not too long ago where I just realized that it's been a long time since I've had a really good, like, belly laugh, mm -hmm. like that kind of just like let go and be in the moment, kind of laugh with your friends. And, you know, we're, we just, we get in such a mind frame of just the list, the laundry list of all the things that we have to do. And it takes that, that child, like that inner child away from us and moves us further and further away from it. And so, you know, I've tried to get in this, in this time of my life where I can kind of cultivate that, 
inner child again and and step into that you know just have fun and laugh and let go of a lot of the things that would otherwise kind of keep me preoccupied or in that in that stressful Absolutely. thinking you know and i love that and yeah. I think, I mean, once we open up and we realize there's a lot of lessons all around us, it doesn't have to come from animals. It's anything that we do in life. Once we reframe the idea that mistakes are to be punished, to more to mistakes can be learned from. And maybe there are no mistakes. It's just you try something, it didn't work out. You just fell. That's it. You move on. Yeah. Right? You get up, move on, you shake. And But going back to the animals for a second, those people that don't necessarily realize the value of an animal yet it might it might be because of conditioning i mean i grew up in eastern europe and i've seen that a lot because it wasn't necessarily something accepted to have animals in the home maybe yeah it's definitely a a cultural thing for sure and yeah yeah i mean it's 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 a big lesson for some people to learn but i believe like you said we are in a state now more of an awakening state people are coming to understand a few of these things on a deeper level we start to realize the connection between everything, not just, let's say, between you and me, Tina, but between you and me, nature, Mother Earth, animals, and everything else, the universe, God, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Sometimes I do this thing where I, I will pretend like when I'm going out or if I'm driving or if I'm in a store, I'm in a movie. And I kind of I kind of remove myself and look at it from a third point like third person point of view, kind of like I am in a virtual reality where I plot myself in the middle of this world and nobody really knows I'm there and I'm just observing it. And it's kind of this thing that I like to do because it it exercises my brain a little bit. But when I do that, it's so much fun because you, you take the personal opinion that you have about whatever you're doing or wherever you're at and everything becomes very generalized and you just kind of observe things from this point of view of like, you know, look at all those people. They're kind of just, you know, going through their routine and they're not really realizing, you know, that cool thing that's sitting right there or whatever. And you just really, it's kind of a fun exercise to do because you just put into, it just kind of puts into perspective just, you know, the things that as humans, we put so much thought and focus on. And we think that it's, it's what people are going to care the most about. I've realized that it's actually not that way and that what people genuinely care about is how they're treated or what their interactions are with somebody and you know somebody's outfit or somebody's car or somebody's house that's all kind of like further down the list for what people remember somebody by you know i you know humans humans i think they crave that connection they crave that positive interaction between two people Like last night I was out at a store and this woman came in and she was wearing this cool hat and she looked beautiful and, you know, she had it going on. She was just styling. And I looked at her and I said, girl, I said, you look beautiful. That hat looks wonderful on you. And she stopped and she looked at me and she goes, thank you so much. She goes, I just, this is the first day wearing this hat and I wasn't really sure if I looked good in it. So thank you so much. And I said, you rock it. I said, you look fantastic, you know? And for her, it was just this really reaffirming moment of like, man, okay. I look okay. You know? And, and I didn't have to say something to her, but in probably Tina many years ago would have been too shy to say something like that to a complete stranger. But, you know, I, I feel like those kind of things can, can really make a difference because I know they've made a difference for me when somebody's shared something kind, you know, those things really make a difference with so much in somebody's life, you know, and we don't even realize the impact. And, you know, I always say if you feel called to do something to help another person, whether it's anonymous or whether they're going to know it, just do it. If, if something in you is being called to do those things, just do it because it may not even be for your own benefit. It could be for this other person and you are just the vessel to provide that Absolutely. healing. Wow, I love that you brought that point up, Tina, and that example so beautiful and the idea of essentially doing acts of kindness just out of kindness, right? Like there's no expectation around that. You don't want anything out of it. It's not necessarily for you, but I would only imagine that it did a lot for you as well. Because I know in my case, I've started implementing that in my own life. But when I do something without expectations for someone else, I feel like a million dollars as a result of it. 
but then I, the impact on them, like you said, you don't even know how much it could mean to them because you could be the first person that says something nice to them all day or maybe all week or maybe even the entire month. And can you imagine the impact you can have on people? And the more we do that, the more we show that love, that unconditional love, the more others can be like, oh, that made me feel good. Maybe it's time for me to apply that in my life. So now it's that yeah. snowball effect, the ripple effect, whatever you want to call it. I love that. Yeah, I mean, it makes such a big difference. And I find that the more you the more you move towards living that version of your life, the the other end of the spectrum, it's almost it's so difficult to be to be in that kind of negative sort of state it's it's almost like i guess to give an example it's like if you're if you're practicing being kind and doing for others and you know being so loving and you know you just it feels good to live that kind of life when you get to be around people who are more negative or that are you know not super nice to people or you're driving in a car with somebody and they're having a moment of road rage and they're flipping somebody off and yelling at somebody you're like oh it's almost like the nails on a chalkboard kind of thing because as you change the frequency and the energy around you those kind of things just they don't they don't appeal you know i've got <laughs> i've got so many friends in my life that love horror movies right they love that whole genre for whatever reason and i can't like i simply cannot watch those things or read those things because it's, it's just, there's something about it that just, I can't be, you know, so it's, it's funny because you'll find yourself not being able to engage in certain things anymore because you're like, Ooh, that doesn't feel good, you know, but that, that is just proof that, you know, we're doing the work and we're actually, you know, getting on the, the better. Exactly. And it also so. sounds that you're actually listening to your heart and you're following your heart as opposed to, maybe doing something, let's say, watch a horror movie with a friend just because you want to please them. You're now actually listening to yourself and you're doing those things that matter to you. And I think that's that's a big lesson I had to learn is to realize that I can do things for myself that may not be in agreement with what others want me to do. But if it's for me yeah. and for my own benefit, it will be okay. Well, you can set those boundaries. A lot of that is about boundaries, you know, and setting healthy boundaries for yourself and recognizing what those boundaries are is first is first step. And then the second step is being able to honor yourself and say, you know, that doesn't feel right to me or no, I don't want to do that. Or, you know, finding the capability of saying no, or, you know, not always being so agreeable because when we sacrifice ourselves like that, it, it catches up to us one way or another. Love this, Tina. So let me ask you, I'll, I'll take a, a different direction. Let me ask you this. If you could go back in time 10 years, let's say, and you could have a chat with your older self and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be and why? Mm. That's a great question. Mm. I often wish I could go back and talk to my younger self. The first thing I would want to do to that, that younger version of me is give her a very big hug. And I would want to tell her, I know a lot of this doesn't make sense. And I know you feel like it's going to be this way forever, but it's temporary. You know, every, every moment that we are in right now is temporary and it's going to get better. And you're going to find your path and you're going to find your people and you're going to be happy, you know, and what everybody else thinks about you right now, it's not going to matter in 10 years. <laughs> That's a beautiful message. That's, you know? yeah. yeah. It's, it's cause there was such a fear living in that person back then, a fear of acceptance, a fear of not being loving or being lovable, just all of the insecurities. And I mean, you know, we all have our insecurities still. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely do, but that person 10 years ago was definitely living more of a fear-based life and way more dependent on the approval and acceptance of other people around her, you know, and that's how she would judge herself is how, you know, is how she would be received. 
I can resonate with that so, so much, so much. So if we were yeah. to now go to the future for a second, and so you know how much or how far you've come along in the last 10 years. So let's think 10 years down the road, yeah. you get to see all the beautiful things you've accomplished in those 10 years, right? All the people you've impacted, the life you've built. And you can have a chat with 10 years older version of you. Maybe it's a 15 minute mentoring session and you could bring one thing back with you. What would it be? Ooh, I feel like in 10 years, I could definitely bring back more of that. I don't give a shit attitude. It's more of like, you know, just listen, honey, just do what you need to do. And, and those who are going to stick around will stick around, you know, I feel like that's going to be the version of myself that will even become more pronounced because I'm just kind of getting there now to where I feel like I'm finding my voice, you know, and I'd say that's been over the last four or five years or so, but man, 50 year old Tina, I have a feeling, I have a feeling she's going to just be like, give me your best shot. I want to see what you got, you know, and just, and just be way more unscathed (laughs) by by a lot of things, you know, I, this period of my life has been such a learning experience and I'm so excited to take the things that I'm learning in my own life right now and apply it to my coaching with my clients, because I feel like it's going to be, I feel like everything that I go through can absolutely benefit the clients that I work with, because it gives me a, it gives me a, sense of empathy that, you know, with everything you go through, you're like, oh my gosh, okay, yeah, no, I know exactly how you're feeling. So let's, let's work on this. You know, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of incredible. I I love getting older. Getting older has never freaked me out. It doesn't like, I wish my whole head would be gray and white. Like I don't, I don't fight the aging process. I, I love it. I think it's beautiful on humans. As we get older, we just get so wise and so much more beautiful from the inside out, you know? And it's it's like it's like as we age, we catch up with that eternal knowledge that's already inside us. It's almost like we start catching up with that that spirit inside of us that knew all this stuff all along, but we had to kind of mature on a physical human level to get there. And it's just it's such a beautiful process, I think. And, and I don't know, this is, I I'm very grateful for everything that I've, that I've been experiencing and all the lessons that I've learned. Yeah, that's not that's a great answer, Tina. And I, I don't think there's a the right or wrong answer, right? But it's always beautiful to see what someone or how someone sees themselves down the road. I always. So what would you, what would yeah, you say I mean, is your answer a, to that question? I, I thought a lot about it, right? And I, I wouldn't necessarily want to bring back anything because like you said a couple of times now, it's going to be okay. Things are going to be fine. You're going to become a better version of yourself because you're putting in the work. So we know that's going to happen. So just enjoy the journey. So if I could, honestly, yeah. I would sit on a bench and then just watch the life of that 50 year old me because I'm also turning 40 this year. So I'll be about 50 as well in 10 years. And just traveling yeah. through the beautiful things I've done over the last 10 years. And I think a quote that comes to mind, and I don't even know who it is attributed to, but it's the idea of the definition of hell is waking up on your last day on earth and meeting the person you could have been. And that stuck with me. Why? Oh you my feel God. That when deep, I heard that huh? well, you know, 10 years ago, so I was like, wow. Right? So I, that's what I want to say. You know what? 10 years from now, I'm going to get to meet the 10 year older version of me and I'm going to be proud of the person. And I want to be like, you know what? That's me in 10 years. Amazing. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey. That's it. Yeah. You know, and that, this is something that I was, I was sharing with a friend of mine yesterday, that whole idea that where we're at right now is temporary. It's like, you know, I, I have, I have wrapped my head around the concept that, when we're going through something that doesn't feel very good to us, it seems like it's going to be around for a lifetime. And it seems like that's going to be the way it is forever. And what I can say from just, you know, I'm sure you could too, just from life experience is that those moments are very temporary and, you know, it's not always going to be like that. 
and and things will change and things will grow and whether you like it or not, you're going to get older and you're going to get more knowledge and you're going to grow as well. And the invitations to take on new ways of living are always going to be there. It just depends on your reluctancy or your openness to accept those invitations, right? So where we're at right now is is temporary and this is a very hard time for a lot of people. There's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of health things going on. There's a lot of financial things going on. And, you know, I, it's, it definitely is for me, it's helped me so much keep in perspective when I think yeah. this is just temporary, you know, and it's not important. It doesn't, it, not, a lot of this stuff, it just, I'm not minimizing the things that people have going on in their lives or their jobs or the things it's, it's not about that, but the focus, you know, it's a shift in focus. It's a shift in focus from material things or from the things that really don't get us to where we need to be shifting focus to the things that really can make a positive impact. And just keeping that whole idea of things are temporary. And and I I love that approach, Tina, and 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 uh, knowing that, like you said, temporary, it's going to be okay. And a bigger one for me as well, not a bigger one, but another one to add on top of it would be the idea, and you mentioned this already, that you have a choice. So do you want to be stuck in that moment for more than just a portion of time, or do you make a choice to get past it? Right. And we always have choice. Yeah. And that's, that's a big, le- that was a big lesson for me because I didn't think I had choices in many of the things I did, but the exercise I did that really opened my eyes was, okay, pick anything that you think you don't have a choice in and drill down and see, did you really have a choice or no choice? And honestly, I've done this, I don't know, maybe a hundred plus things in my life that I thought I had no choice over. And every single one, once you drill down and it was like, yeah, I had a choice. I just didn't choose it because it was uncomfortable or because it was scary or because it was going against the norm, right? You can fill in the blanks. We always were amazing at making up excuses for this type of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, we put, we, there's so many conditions that we put on ourselves and, you know, it's, it's just been such an amazing journey because you learn, there's just, so, there's just learning so much. And I mean, I know, you know, in the past, you and I have spoke about just recently me discovering that through ancestry and, and DNA testing and things like that, that, you know, my biological father was different than the father that raised me. And that in itself was something that I found out organically. And it was not something that I searched for, but it was something that was revealed to me at this time in my life because I initially took some DNA testing several years ago where had I, I guess I I feel like at the time I might not have been ready for that. And so that level of awareness did not lead me to kind of look deeper into that. But at this stage in my life, I guess I was, I was more ready and I was guided to, to look deeper into it. And I've made all these discoveries of, of half siblings I didn't know I had. And, 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 but it, it's been a very hard journey, but the one that the one major thing on out of many things that continues to pop out to me is that with that, I had to, go through a process of letting go what I thought that I was a part of me that I thought that I was that I am 100% not that, that culture or that ethnic background. So then it's the acceptance of what I actually am. And the fact that I have this whole other at a DNA cellular level, this, this cellular memory that comes with, having this DNA in me that comes from a completely different culture. Right. But the one thing that really resonated with me was like, this was the greatest placebo effect test ever because the family that I grew up with are my family. I love them. I love them like blood family, even though now in my knowledge, I know that they're not my blood family, but it's it's a really it's a really amazing thing that sometimes we think that if we are related to somebody that's the strongest bond but really you know what i have learned is that it's all about 
your intention and it's all about what you put into these relationships because your family and your and the loved ones in your life, they don't have to be what you thought they were, you know? And I don't know. It was just, it's just a crazy, it, that was like a crazy concept for me where I sat back one yeah. day and I was like, holy crap, you know, like this was kind of like a, a placebo effect where, <laughs> you know, if, because I didn't know any better, I didn't think any different and I just loved them like they were my family and they have become, well, that's, they that's are a great family. testament to the uh, power of love, right. And unconditional love to some extent, yeah. because, you know, you, I would, this is my opinion, but it sounds like you love them as your family because you, there was a condition that they were your family, but then the condition got slightly removed or lowered and you still love them. So truly it was unconditional love. Yeah. And it's a testament that yes, we can get there. We can do that. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's that whole part of it. I mean, I grew up with these people, you know, they've, they played such a major part in my life. So I can't even imagine them not being in my life or loving them as the people that I know them to be. But it's also the acceptance of this new, these new people into my life and, and, you know, encouraging those relationships and building those new relationships. And that's a really beautiful thing too. And then, you know, it's just, I, I guess the theme around all of that, like you just said, is just the power of love and just, you know, the people in your life, the, the family in your life can be whoever you choose them to be. You know, it's not, it's not specific to the people you were born into. That's all. such a powerful message and a big, big lesson for me and others as well, I would imagine. So Tina, I can't thank you enough. It's been such a pleasure talking with you. And before we wrap up today, I would like to ask you to share where people can find more of you, any social media, or what they could connect if they want to work with you or learn more about your journey. Sure. So my website that explains more of the type of coaching I do, it's soulcirclehealing.com. They can find me on there. I also host a meetup group on the website meetup.com. We do Zoom interactions sometimes for the local people. I try to do things in person, but meetup.com and then my group name on there is Soul Circles. And, uh, you know, it's, it's something that's free to attend. And we'll usually have one or two meetups a month where we'll talk about different things, you know, inside of the spiritual and physical world. Or if somebody has a suggestion, you know, we can kind of go with that too. I also can be found on radiantcoachesacademy.com. You know, you can find my profile on there, but awesome. yeah, we'll put them in the show notes as well, be. Tina, so that people can find them. Thank you so much sure. again. It's been, a, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's been awesome talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being with us today. To find out more amazing content and episodes, please visit unleashthyself.com or you can find us on social media.